Hi everyone, this is Nick Pollock here from Roar Lions Roar. While you're here, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that alert bell so you never miss any of our new content. And if you prefer to listen instead of watch, make sure you check us out on your podcast platform of choice where you can subscribe and download each new episode. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Go State! Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Roar Lions Roar. I'm your host, Bill DeFilpo. I don't have a co-host tonight. We have a special guest on to talk about Penn State's game this week against the fighting Maryland Terrapins. Maryland coming to this game 6-3 and three on the season. Been a bit of an up-and-down year for them. They've uh, won those six games, looked pretty good in a number of them, even in two of their losses against Michigan and Purdue. They've uh, they've managed to hang around, hang around in those games. But this past week against uh, Wisconsin, Bit of a stinker. We're going to talk about what they do on both sides of the football. And we're going to talk about a few other things pertaining to Penn State football because our guest on today's episode is Daniel Gallen of Lions 24-7. Daniel, what's going on, man? I'm doing good, Bill. Just a, a wonderful Wednesday night in Happy Valley, ready to talk some Terps, talk some Lions. Yes, Daniel, uh, of course, in addition to uh, being a person who has been... How long have you been on the Penn State beat for? Uh, this is my second Daniel? season. Second season. Second season. So he's been on the Penn State beat for a few years. He is also a Terp. He's able to give us a little bit of insight into Maryland. That is actually going to be a little bit unique just because everybody else I know who went to Maryland uh, doesn't cover college football. So they can cover, talk about it from a few different angles. But before we get into that, uh, because we got Daniel here, because he's around the team so frequently, uh, I, I, Daniel, I want to get your thoughts on how this season has gone so far. For Penn State, Nittany Lions seven and two on the year. Uh, their loss is Ohio State and Michigan. Nothing we don't have to rehash at this point. But it's fascinating to me because earlier this week, James Franklin uh, gave this quote about a lack of a signature win. How they're staring down a ten and two season, but they kind of lack that big. Uh, sort of win that you can hang your hat on. And I find this interesting just because it's a conversation I had with my friends before Franklin just happened to get asked about that. Uh, and he basically said, what you want is both, right, in regards to wins and that signature win. That's what the best programs of college football are attempting to do. I think it's a fair point. So what are just your general thoughts as someone who is around this team on this season that they've had so far? And again, that kind of lack of the win that you can – hang your hat on, build on as like a thing to show that you have arrived in that upper echelon of college football beyond just having that good record. I think that part of it is is out of your control uh, as a football program. When, when you look at the schedule, I mean, Auburn, last year that was a ranked versus ranked game, and you've seen how things have gone for that program. So that's something where when you look at it on paper at the beginning of the year, you think, okay, that might be a win that you can hang your hat on. And I think that independent of how Auburn has done, I, I think that's probably their signature win this year, going on the road in the SEC and just laying a beat down uh, on a team, albeit a team that had a dead man walking as a coach uh, for a very long time. Um, but also it's like part of it is just the schedule not really cooperating. Like Auburn is down. Uh, Michigan State is down. Uh, it looked like Purdue might be, okay, maybe they're that team that sneaks in there and is ranked. Maybe they're in the top 20. And that win looks really good later on. Um, that hasn't really been the case. If Maryland won last week at Wisconsin, there's a decent chance that they're ranked this week. So you can get that ranked win. And I, I know that, you know, most Penn State fans don't want Maryland to be the signature win over the course <laughs> of a season. But it, there's things that have been a little bit outside of Penn State's control. You look at the, at the rankings, the AP poll, the coaches poll, the CFP, it's just... Ohio State and Michigan. Those are the only two teams ranked. Like mm -hmm. Purdue and Maryland have been in the receiving votes ca category here and there. Um, but part of it is just how things have shaken out with the schedule. Um, but obviously, you want to beat Ohio State. You want to beat Michigan. Mm -hmm. Because getting a signature win and combining that with getting the rest of the wins, that's how you make that leap uh, into that upper echelon, into that upper tier. That's where James Franklin wants to be. That's where Penn State wants to be. Um, I think the lack of a signature win, I think that where they are right now um, in kind of the landscape doesn't necessarily hurt them. Um, I mean, part of it is I mean, you can only play who's on your schedule, um, but it's not like they're jockeying for CFP right now. You know, they're trying to be in that New Year's Six category. And I think that, 
I think that like the idea of a signature win isn't necessarily as a big of a deal when you're trying to figure out nine, 10, 11 than it is when you're trying to figure out four, five, six. So I thought it was an interesting, it was an interesting talking point. And it is kind of the thing where like you look at the schedule, like I was, I was out last night and the Ohio game was on the TV and I was kind of half jokingly like, is, is Ohio going to end up being Penn State's best win of the year in terms of record? Um, it was just kind of one of those things where it's like, ah, like the schedule hasn't really cooperated on that. So, I mean, part of it is Penn State not beating Ohio State or Michigan, but part of right. it is Auburn, Michigan State, everybody else not being good. Right. It, it, it's a fascinating conversation for m- me because I'm just thinking about how the last two years have gone. And I think that adds like a really important bit of context to all of this, because if if Penn State was like, you know, this was their third straight year where you're winning, you know, one of them was the pandemic year. So you're losing two games. The two games that you're losing are to two teams above you in the conference. And that's just it for the, and you know, not to say that there's no chance that they lose uh, to Maryland Rutgers or Michigan state down the stretch, but you, you know, just in this hypothetical where Penn state is coming off of two years where if they came out and they took, they, they went seven and five or they went eight and four and they lost both of those games to say Purdue and Auburn, we're sitting here talking about how Penn state made one of the biggest mistakes in college football with the contract that they gave James Franklin. Right. Like it's, it's just so fascinating to me how this has like, I I don't want to say developed because there is certainly a hair of truth to it, but like, is it really worth knocking a team um, because Minnesota is a little bit worse than you thought? or Minnesota wasn't able to hold up their end of the bargain after a really good start to the season to produce hit some bumps in the road or Auburn has decided to become a catastrophe or all these sorts of things. So like, I think that's, and tell me if I'm wrong because I very well might be looking at this through blue and white colored glasses, but uh, after the last two years, it feels very weird to me to say, well, the issue now is that you haven't knocked off one of those teams when the conversation coming into the season was, oh boy, this is this has the potential to be another eight and four season. And again, if that happens, God knows what the conversation is around Penn State football right now. I think there's there's a couple of different uh, pieces of that. I think that one that I've kind of thought about a little bit too over the, over the past few weeks, where uh, you know when when those losses hit uh, the the angst quotient, it felt like got ramped up a little bit. <laughs> Um, and I think that it would be a thing where if you told any Penn State fan, you know, after the past two years that that Penn State has had that you're it's November, you're seven and two, you're in the top 15. I think that if you told anyone that in August, I think that most people would take that, um, yeah. given what we've seen. And I think that in terms of that 30,000 foot view, it's good for the program. You're in the right direction. But when you're actually in it, and you're going week to week, living and dying, um, and kind of how it has happened. I think that that's something that makes it a little, a lot more intense uh, and and a lot more fraught. Um, so I think that right where we are right now, it's really easy to kind of be like, like you said, to be like, oh, like you know, you got to beat Ohio State, you got to beat Michigan, or or the season is is a wash. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that when we get to the end of the season. Um, I think that, and you're able to look back on things, I think that it'll be a little bit easier to, to stomach, I guess. I mean, neither of those losses were, were easy to stomach for different reasons in the moment because of how both of them happened um, and how close Penn State really was to beating Ohio State a couple weeks ago. Um, but I think that if Penn State can get to 10 and 2, um, I think that you'll look back on it and you'll see this as a, as a good season. I think that when they lost that second game to Ohio State, uh, there's kind of a lot of questions about where do you go now because mm-hmm. you're you are pretty much eliminated uh, from Big Ten contention, which in turn uh, you know shuts you out of the playoff, which are the the two ultimate goals for for every team going into a season. Um, and people were you know trying to figure out, all right, do you just kind of like basically like pack it in and you know, it's on to 2023? And 
my whole mindset was that, no, I mean, you still have to win as many games as possible this year because that's kind of the next step, you know, in terms of rebuilding from bottoming out uh, in 2020 and last season, you know, before you can, I feel like it's kind of like you got to walk before you can run. Like you got to get back to that 10, 11, 11 win with a bowl game range. Uh, and then you can kind of start being like, all right, let's beat Ohio state. Let's beat Michigan. Um, I think that those are those things definitely could have happened last year. But I think when you zoom out and you look at how these past like three or four years have gone, um, I think that you can look at this as a good step forward uh, for Penn State. That's my that's my very, I think, the, the most rational view I think that I can come at this with, uh, yeah. with, with where this team is right now. But it, it really is the thing where it's like, like I picked Penn State to go eight and four this year. Um, I had them losing to Purdue and then losing to either Auburn uh, or Michigan State. Um, Purdue was kind of the dumb one that that you factor in there, and I thought Auburn and Michigan State would be better. So they're exceeding my expectations. Um, but it is kind of the thing where when you're actually in it, you're kind of like, oh, this can be a lot better. This could be better. So you just got to take a step back, st- take a step back, have a drink of water, take a deep breath, and you know we'll we'll see where we are in, in January. Yeah, it's very, to me, this is basically a conversation, one of the million conversations we could have about the various ways in which the divisions in the Big Ten suck, right? Like, if if Penn State was in the same, divi- the same division as Michigan or Ohio State, I, I wonder how, like, the tenor of this is, because I just feel like when you have that one hurdle that you have to clear, it's a little bit easier of a pill to swallow than, like, Oh boy, Michigan and Ohio State. Like it legitimately can feel like Michigan and Ohio State at their best are just going to mow through everyone, beat the hell out of each other at the end of the season. And the, like that game is essentially a playing game in the playoffs. So it's it's an interesting conversation. It's one that, like, like I mentioned, I was having it with friends before Franklin happened to get asked about it. And the timing of it was fascinating. And the timing of it was also a little bit fascinating because it came on the heels of the two losses to Michigan and Ohio state. You know, they have, you know, they go into Bloomington and they whoop up on Indiana, but the season at this point is basically judged by Michigan and Ohio state. And Daniel in recent years, you know, to kind of get back on track and talk about where the team, this specific team is right now, Penn state has had this very, very nasty habit over the years, losing a game, losing the game after that because they just didn't look right. And if they did that this year, that meant they would have gone lost to Michigan, losing the whiteout, lose to Ohio State. Three losses in a row, that that completely changes the calculus. On You know, at that point, Penn State, we're talking about them as number 14 right now. They might be the number 25 team in the country if they're lucky. So as someone who is around the program a lot more than us, as someone who has been around the program for a couple of years now, is there something different about this group, about the players, about the coaches, whatever, that you think has led, to, you know, has a, the vibes a little bit different? There's the approach is a little bit different. Maybe they're a little bit hardened by these past experiences. So now we're on the heels of a Penn State team that, you know, got the hell kicked out of them in Ann Arbor and then came back with a great response. Got the hell kicked out of them uh, by, eh, that's unfair, lost to Ohio <laughs> State came back with a great response. And now we're talking about a team that again is looking at a 10 and two campaign. Yeah. I I think that going into that Minnesota game, I was on a little bit of upset alert, not, not, you know, a hundred percent because it's the whiteout they're coming home. I think that those, the players know that, that you can't lay an egg uh, in in Mm -hmm. that situation. And also Minnesota didn't have Tanner Morgan. Um, I was a little bit more on upset alert uh, going into Indiana because that's the ultimate letdown spot. Um, <laughs> Cause kind of like we talked about where you're out of big 10 contention, barring something, you know, really, really unexpected. Um, you know, Indiana is really bad. Um, like that is not a good football team. I, so. I, I think, I think every single person in the Penn state universe, myself included uh, thought about, every other time Penn state has ever played Indiana instead of this Indiana team, which is like woeful doesn't even begin to describe how bad they are. Yeah. I I picked Penn state to cover big time. So I I felt smart about that, but still in the back (laughs) of my head, it was kind of like, 
it was kind of like, ah, oh, the weather's going to be weird. Like it, it is a letdown spot and it didn't happen. And so I think that that reflects very well on the leadership. Uh, the one guy who's come up a lot when, when you talk, James Franklin has brought him up. Other players have brought him up is PJ Mustafer, um, you know, the big defensive tackle. Uh, he got hurt last year in the Iowa game. Um, and you kind of, you can, you know, is causation correlation, you know, that whole thing, because the next game in Illinois runs all over them, um, you know, after Mustafer gets hurt. Um, and so, you know, you kind of wonder what they lost with him. And, you know, he wasn't on the field. Um, he wasn't around the team that much. You know, like he talked about last year's Ohio State game. He was watching it. I think he was in the hospital because he was about to or, or just had surgery. Um to, on his injury. And so, you know, he wasn't physically there. Um, and he's someone who's regarded as kind of the, the heartbeat of the team. Everything goes through him. Um, he is sort of the, the linchpin, um, I think, both on that defensive line, because there aren't too many people with, with his frame. Um, and then just from a leadership perspective, you know, because he's been around, you know, he's a fifth year senior. He decided to come back and use the COVID year. Um, I mean, if he doesn't get hurt last year, Penn State, probably isn't seven and five and he's probably making millions in the NFL right now. Um, so I think getting him back um, is good. And I think the leadership is, is a little bit different last than last year. When you look at kind of the, the, the best players on the team, kind of like Jahan Dotson was a very, was a quiet, like lead by example kind of guy. Um, and, and Jaquan Brisker was a little bit similar. Um, but now you have guys that are like, Jair Brown um, and PJ Mustafer, who are a little bit more gregarious, I feel like. Like, I feel like the leadership style is just a little bit different. Um, and I think from as an outsider, I think that that kind of changes the the dynamic um, a little bit. But I think PJ Mustafer deserves a lot of credit. You know, he's someone who who always comes up, um, and you know, people always say good things about him. So. I think he's played played a big role in kind of helping keep things, uh, you know, at least at status quo and, and not going down the snowball road. A lot of us were expecting. Yeah, I, I mean, just as someone who uh, follows this, f- follows that part of it from afar, it basically seems like at this point, PJ, Jire Brown, and Sean Clifford, like they all might as well just be like in addition to their roles on the team, like be considered like ambassadors from the (laughs) locker room. Like it seemed, it it legitimately seems like, you know, for how, uh, you know, James Franklin knows how to play the game. He knows which guys he wants to put up, but it always seems like everything comes back to those three dudes. Yeah. I mean, they were the three who were in Indianapolis for big 10 media days. um, And that's kind of how I feel like that's how you, you set the tone and you send a message and, I thought that that all three of them, you know, really handled themselves well out there. And there's kind of a, a genuine excitement um, from them in terms of looking forward to the season, uh, kind of laughing, joking around, knowing that despite how the past two years went, that there could be something, uh, you know, special-ish um, on deck. So I, I think that Penn State's leadership this year and, and the captains, I, I think they've done a really good job and um, that things are just in a, a very good spot where it's not going to completely fracture when it feels like there have been points where it could. And one potential uh, opportunity for things to fracture is this upcoming week against Maryland. Before we uh, talk about that, I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this podcast, Home Field Apparel. Daniel, you, uh, you hear this Home Field Apparel thing? I'm wearing it right now. Wearing it right now. The Home Field Apparel uh, Texas Longhorns uh, Bevo shirt, correct? That is for, correct. For, for the fine folks who are listening to this edition of the podcast. I actually, uh, no, I don't have Home Field on right now, which is weird because I usually do, even if they were not the sponsor of our podcast. Uh, if you are a college sports fan on the internet, you are surely aware of Home Field Apparel. They are a premium collegiate college sports brand based out of lovely Indianapolis, Indiana. The shirts are comfortable. They're unique. Uh, not just their shirts, their uh, hoodies, their crew necks, their joggers, everything that they have in their collection rocks. The designs are very cool. Uh, Daniel, not a Longhorn, but that Texas shirt is very cool. I have my St. Peter's joggers in my bedroom. I have a, a Hawaii Rainbow Warriors t-shirt. Like Everything that they have 
they take the time to make sure it makes you feel closer to a school or get you interested in another school. I would be a big fan even if they didn't sponsor the podcast, but they do. And because of that, you can get anything in their collection, Penn State or otherwise, with 15% off of your first order with the promo code Roar Lions Roar, one word, all uppercase. Again, new customers for Homefield Apparel can use the promo code Roar Lions Roar, one word, all uppercase for 15% off of your first order. Thank you again to Homefield Apparel for sponsoring this edition of the podcast. Let's get to, back to talking about this weekend's matchup between Penn State and Maryland. The Nittany Lions are 10-point favorites uh, with Maryland coming to town. The game kicks off at 3.30 p.m. on Fox. Uh, Daniel, I, I want to start just by asking, how like often do you get to sit down and watch entire Maryland football games? And just like, what is your relationship w- with the team while you are sitting down and watching them? Mostly while I watch, it's just kind of checking in on on guys that I've just seen their names uh, for for so long um, because just, you know, I still follow everyone on Twitter that I followed when I was at Maryland as a student, uh, when I covered them for the Baltimore Sun in 2015. Um, so you and when you do that, you know, you just kind of absorb, um, you know, things through osmosis, like, you know, that these guys are still around. Um, you know, you randomly know that the punter, you know, was one of Ray's eight and got added to the Ray guy award <laughs> watch list. That's just kind of the, the information that you, uh, you know, that, that you absorb, but you know, I'll, and of course, like I got a bunch of text threads with, with people from school, you know, from home who, you know, I'll be covering a Penn state game and I'll get a text that something weird's happening in the Maryland game. So I just, you know, check the box score and, and go from there. Um, but I try to I try to watch the the unique matchups um, that they'll play. Uh, you know, when they open the season against West Virginia, um, that was something different. Um, I liked covering that rivalry and watching that rivalry when I was a student. Um, and you know, if they have a, a Friday night game, you know, they played at Illinois, I think, on Friday night last year. So I, I caught part of, part of that. Um, I was going to watch the, the Iowa game that they played last year, but that one was over by the time I could actually get to the television. Um, so I, I really didn't watch that one. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, you just kind of check in. I mean, it's your alma mater. Um, you know, you always have some sort of relationship with them, even yeah. if it can get kind of complicated, um, you know, given the fact that your family gave them tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> over the course of, of a few years. Um, but you know, it's always fun to, to watch, see what they're doing in the uniform space uh, and just kind of see how the program has grown. Because like when I enrolled in, in 2010, Ralph Region was still the coach. They were an ACC program coming off a, a two and 10 season. Um, and to see them make the move into the Big Ten, build this new facility, you know, try to, to modernize and, and compete with the big boys. Um, it, it's been, you know, a, a pretty big journey with a lot of uh, speed bumps in it. And it's kind of, you know, kind of like, okay, like when I'm older and, you know, if I, if I ever have kids and that sort of thing, showing people my alma mater, it's kind of like, yeah. yeah, this is what, this is what the journey is. This is how it got to this point. That building over there used to be the basketball arena, you know, just kind of that stuff and, and just sort of knowing the history. So uh, if my math is correct, you would have been fresh out of school uh, when they came to Happy Valley in 2014. Is that correct? I, I watched the 2014 game from an Applebee's in College Park because uh, I was I was visiting friends and I think I had to be in the the DC area to to do some work uh, when I when I was freelancing. But I did I do remember watching that game in, in 2014. Go, going out on a limb, it got a little bit uh, raucous in that College Park Applebee's at one point or another. It was empty. <laughs> 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 they they uh, were not doing they were not doing the wing special for, uh, for yeah, whatever we'll reason that nah, will do it the wing special was only for home games not for listen man not once, for road games once once stefan Diggs like decided they weren't going to shake hands i figured they would have like all rules would have gone out the window at the shake Park gate Academy. baby shake gate baby. that it, didn't uh didn't randy edsel say he wanted to make a trophy for that game or something he said i mean the big randy thing off of that game was that in the post-game press conference he said like he opened the post-game press conference by saying let the rivalry begin um or or something along those lines Uh, i think that i think they did try i think Rutgers was probably the most likely 
thing to become a trophy game um, that <laughs> that never really, you know, uh, got got legs, I guess. Well, it, it's interesting that like you say the let the rivalry begin thing because you know, it, it seemed like James Franklin did not take that game particularly well based on what the years after that turned into, but. Last couple of years, uh, Maryland, of course, came to Penn State in 2020 and uh, knocked them off during uh, that kind of lost COVID year for the Nittany Lions. 35-19 Tally attack by Loa, Rock and Jarrett had huge games in that one. And then last year, Penn State won 31-14 to in a game that was closer than that final score would indicate. Uh, there was a big Jire Brown interception uh, that kind of yeah, uh, Penn State scored 17 points in the fourth quarter. It was 14-14 early on in the fourth, and then Jahan Dotson does some Jahan Dotson stuff. So uh, it, it, it's a, it's gotten interesting in these last couple of years. Uh, and the Terrapins this year, a team that I've been fascinated in basically all season long because I think they are – pretty good they're 35th in sp plus 30th in offensive sp plus 49th defensively and 22nd in special teams it's actually funny when you go uh to look at total offense passing offense rushing offense points per game and then you do the same for defense penn state wherever they are in basically every single metric uh maryland is the team directly behind them except for i think passing and rushing yards allowed per game and there's one a one team cushion so i don't know about you but i think that while penn state i would say is a more talented team i would say these are two teams that are going to be pretty evenly matched heading into this weekend i think it's going to be close early on i think that maryland is definitely going to be up for this game um especially with, with how last week went and I know that that's a more intangible thing, but I think that it's something that matters when you get into conference play and especially when you get into this point of the year. I mean, it's November. Um, we all know that Penn State is dealing with a lot of injuries. Um, I think when you get to this point of the year, it's there's a lot of you know want to, uh, for lack of a better term. And I think that Maryland, you know, the fact that they got to bowl eligibility so early this year, um, I think that that is a, was a big deal for them, and I think that they they don't want to just leave it um, leave it at that. So I think that they're going to be up for it, and there is still like a lot of talent um, on both sides of the ball. I I was looking at through their offensive stats, and they've got six guys with at least twenty catches. Um, I think coming into this year, you thought that uh, Rakim Jarrett was going to be a, a big volume guy. Um, you know, I think that. Uh, it, it, Talia Tungavailo has really spread the ball around. And when you look at those six guys, Dante Demas isn't one of them. Um, he only has 14 catches this year coming off of that really bad knee injury. Um, I think it was knee injury um, last year. So it is really interesting. I mean, they're running the ball, I think, better than a lot of people thought. Uh, Roman Hemby, uh, he went to my high school. Uh, I think he's the, the first big-time uh, D1 football player in quite a long time from the John Carroll School in Bel Air, Maryland. Um, but, you know, he's been running the ball really well. Um, they've been able to kind of control games on the ground, which I think a lot of people thought with Tonga Vailoa, it was just going to be airing it out a lot. Um, you know, and he's completing nearly 70% of his passes, um, but fourteen t only 14 touchdowns. Um, I think that it's, they've won games a little bit differently than I thought a lot of people had. And I think that the way that they've won, you know, could play uh, in, in Happy Valley on Saturday. Yeah, we'll get to Maryland's offense against Penn State's defense in a sec, because I actually think that's like fascinating. Uh, but we'll start with the other side of the football and you look at Penn State's offense against this Maryland defense. And the thing that I think we've started to see in recent weeks from Maryland is their defense can be a little bit leaky uh, last week. Uh, you know, it wasn't a beat down uh, by Wisconsin scored only 23 points, but 355 yards for Wisconsin's offense. Can't, you know, that, that can certainly be a lot. 24 points allowed to Northwestern the week before that 33 points allowed to Indiana the week before that 31 to Purdue the week before that. And these are offenses that we know to not be like spectacular, I look through this Maryland defense, I look through the stats on them, and they're consistently, you know, outside of the top 50 and just about everything, Daniel. And it seems to me like this is a kind of game where Penn State, you know, coming off of what they did last week against Indiana, where they had 
everything going where they were able to throw and run the ball efficiently. I think they should be able to do that again against a defense that, you know, they don't really create a ton of havoc plays. They don't really get to the quarterback a ton. They don't get a ton of sack tackles for loss. Like, like it, it just seems like a really good opportunity for Penn state's offense to be able to build off of what they did last week. It's definitely a good chance to string together back to back big time games. And I think I, I look at those freshman running backs um, as, as guys that uh, can have big games. You talk about Wisconsin putting together uh, 355 yards of offense. I mean, they got nothing from Graham Mertz. Um, you know, that was all all guys on the ground. Um, so I think when you, you look at that, I think that that's something that Penn State can be able to exploit, uh, especially with how Katron Allen and Nick Singleton are, are both running right now. I mean, Katron Allen is just so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Aeneas Hawkins had the tweet where, you know, he's an NFL running back, but he's only like 13. Um, But that (laughs) like that mix of of patience and burst. And he has that ability to just find a hole and still be a powerful runner, even though he's dropped 25 pounds since he got to college. Like it's just a very, very intriguing combination. And then you look at Nick Singleton where his – Yards per carry have kind of steadily dropped over the past couple weeks, but at the same time, he's he's gotten better as a running back, and it's clear that he's gotten better. Where he's not trying to bounce things outside as much anymore, he's not getting caught for you know three or four yard losses. You know he is taking it in between the tackles, uh, and he's strong enough that when he's in there, if he gets hit, he can still you know if he gets hit one yard in, he can still get three or four yards out of it. Jaylon Sider talked a lot about that last week, that both of these running backs can turn four yards into six yards, and that's really huge for the offense. So you look at what Maryland or what Wisconsin did to Maryland last week, um, I think that the weather, I think the weather's supposed to be like a little sketchy this weekend, or at least on Friday it will be. Um, So it could be a little bit of a wet track, a little bit, a little bit slicker there. Um, I think that, I think Penn State could have some success on the ground. I think that that's what I'm looking for, uh, because I think the one thing that we've learned about, you know, Sean Clifford as a quarterback, I mean, Clifford's averaged 367 yards per game against Maryland in his career, but the games this year where the game has ended and you've been like, okay, that was a good Sean Clifford game, uh, where the Auburn game where he was 14 of 19 for like 178 yards. And then this Indiana game where even though he only threw for 239 yards and had that interception, it felt like a solid Sean Clifford game. So if the running game can get things going um, and you take the pressure off of him and he just kind of moves the chains when he needs to, makes a couple good throws, does enough to withstand those one or two mistakes, um, I think that Penn State should be in in good shape offensively. Yeah, Maryland, uh, there are only three other defenses in the Big Ten, Indiana, Michigan State, and Nebraska that are allowing more passing yards per game. Uh, than the Terrapins, but again, Penn State is, uh, there, there's one, uh, what is it, uh, quick maths, 4.7 yards uh, per game more than Penn State's defense is. The thing is, Penn State has, like, been a little bit better at keeping teams from scoring, but even then, like, it's not by not by a ton. Uh, looking at this Maryland defense, I it, it's weird because there's usually one or two guys that I think you can point to, you know, a guy like a Nick cross or going a little farther back will likely where you're looking at them and they go, okay, they have some stuff about them that can kind of change games. They have a couple of good linebackers in Amon McCullough and Jay Sean Barham. Uh, Their defensive backs are, uh, I think busy would be the best word to describe uh, how things have gone for them this season, but it doesn't seem to me in the bits that I've watched and what the numbers say about them. Like Maryland really has like any game-changing dudes on defense who Pence, who Penn State have to worry about beyond the fact that, you know, they have such a patchwork offensive line. Are there any guys who, as you've looked into this game a little bit, Daniel, really jump out to you? Or do you think it's more just like, you know, they have a s- solid floor at all three levels of their defense? I think Jay Sean Barham is probably on that trajectory to be one of those guys. But even as a freshman, I, I don't necessarily think he's there yet. Um, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, they don't have high sack numbers. The, the tackle for loss numbers aren't really high either. 
Um, so it is kind of uh, when you when you look at the team on paper, it, it's hard to find kind of like the guy. Um, but I think Barham can be that. Um, I think Dracorian Bennett is a guy that's played a lot of football at, at cornerback. He's a JUCO guy. Uh, he was actually teammates with uh, Mitch Tinsley um, at Hutchinson Community College uh, when, when both of them were coming out of high school. Um, and so I think that he's someone who's like solid. I think that the way that I, I look at a lot of these uh, defenders on Maryland is that if you're playing Madden, uh, they're all like, 82 overall or maybe 78 overall 77 where it's like Mm. you can get by with them but it won't necessarily be the most spectacular thing um i've always liked tarheeb steel as a player um you know it's watching him it seems like that he's able to make a play here or there um you know things like that but you know they don't have that you know a really good edge rusher um they don't really have a guy in, in the middle of the defense where you're like okay, he's going to plug up a bunch of holes and, and free guys up to make plays. So I think that when you look at the, the personnel um, and, and the talent level, if you're looking at stars on offense versus stars on defense, I mean, I think Penn State uh, has a, a pretty distinct uh, advantage there. And then you flip it over to the other side of the football. And like when we you, you mentioned it while you were talking about uh, Maryland a little while ago, but it is fascinating to me that they have ran the ball more than they have thrown it this year they have uh ran the ball 317 times and of course there are 14 sacks for Talia Tagovailoa factored into that uh and thrown it 303 times uh there was of, of course a spell where Talia was out due to injury and his backup Billy Edwards Jr. had to come in but I still think you know it, it, it's not like they've been air raid in every other game. And in those games, they just turned into Wisconsin or anything. Like it's been a legitimately balanced offense this year. And Daniel, I don't know if coming into this season after watching this Penn state secondary against Ohio state as like the thing I wanted to see, I've been dying to watch what happens when Penn state secondary goes up against a Maryland passing attack that has a really good quarterback, a bunch of really good pass catchers and is going to want to spread the ball around and hit guy after guy after guy and not let Penn state just block onto one dude in particular. It, it, it It's really kind of fun when you think about it with, with what, how Penn state matches up uh, with, with Maryland, because you know, that Ohio state game, that's kind of the, that's the heavyweight fight. You knew that that was just going to be blow for blow. C.J. Stroud, you know, looking for Marvin Harrison, looking for Emeka Buka. Like, you kind of knew that Ohio State was going to get theirs. They weren't going to make many mistakes, and you just kind of had to withstand it. Whereas when you look at Maryland and you look at Tunga Vailoa, uh, this is kind of like maybe the, the undercard where things can get a little crazy. Uh, because Maryland is such, like Tunga Vailoa has just been such a high variance player mm-hmm. um, over the course of his career where he can light it up, but then he can also have that Iowa game last year uh, where he just got picked off five times. Um, so I think that, you know, Maryland's playmakers and that offense has such a high ceiling. I mean, we saw what Kim Jarrett did to Penn State just as a freshman uh, two years ago. Jacob Copeland came in from Florida um, and has been a really big play threat, and I think has kind of mitigated uh, Demas coming back from, from that injury. Um, and then the, the tight end, Corey Dykes, who's 6'2", 220, a you know, bit of a smaller, bit of a, a speedier, slighter guy at that position. You know, He and uh, Jarrett have, are tied for the lead in receiving yards, and he's someone who's made some plays. I just think that there's such an array of weapons, and you know, any one of them can, can hurt you and, and make some big plays. But at the same time, if the quarterback can't get them the ball, you know, this could be a big Joey Porter Jr. interception game. You know, that's Mm -hmm. the one thing about Joey Porter Jr. that kind of comes up when you're trying to poke some holes uh, in in his, uh, you know, case as a defensive back and at the next level. It's like, well, where's the interceptions? Uh, Kalen King just got his first interception of his career last week. Uh, It took him that long to get there. Um, So I think that these defensive backs are going to be busy. And it's just, it is just going to be a, a really fun matchup. And I'm just very interested to see how Penn State decides to match up with them. Um, you know, we've seen Manny Diaz be really creative this year in making sure and getting all four of Penn State's top cornerbacks on the field together at the same time. 
uh, with Johnny Dixon playing some in the slot along with Daquan Hardy. Um, so if, you know, if it's Daquan Hardy or um, Johnny Dixon in the slot against Rakim Jarrett, that's something that, that I really want to see because that's going to be a matchup that Maryland will probably take notice of, you know, so how can those guys withstand that? So I think that from that passing, pure passing perspective, I think that the, you know, unpredictability and the potential of Maryland's offense makes it, you know, makes it really fun and, and really intriguing to kind of game out and think about where we could be on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. And, and two notes uh, that I just had jotted down. One is that uh, Jarrett is considered a game time decision due to a leg injury. Uh, I hope he plays because he is a marvelous football player, but uh, Mike Loxley said he didn't practice on Tuesday uh, going to go through uh, warmups. Then they're going to make a decision on him. And then uh, Maryland's other tight end CJ Dippery. Uh, I was just looking into him. It said he is from German Pennsylvania. Uh, so I ended up clicking and it turns out that his 24 seven profile pick is him in Beaver stadium, wearing blue and white uh, and Penn state never offered him a scholarship. So I fully expect him to go for uh, <laughs> at least two touchdowns in this game, because that's how this works. But uh, all seriousness, you mentioned the word variance when it came to Talia and that like, that's been the word that I've been using for him all season long. Like you mentioned that Iowa game last year, uh, Wisconsin last year, uh, last week, of course, happened in some windy circumstances, but I think even on his worst day, it, even if I told you that going into the game, you would not have expected that Talia was going to go 10 for 23 for 77 yards, a touchdown and an interception. But at the same time, you then look and see like, okay, he had two picks against Michigan, but 20 for 30, 207 yards and a touchdown not bad he has some really big yardage and really productive games sprinkled throughout here and you mentioned the fact that he has been you know more point guard than guy who is trying to huck the ball down the field he's at uh eight yards per attempt on the season he's not exactly like trying to kill teams deep and as his career has gone on his yards per attempt number is actually this is actually the lowest yards per attempt uh of his career by 0.1 yards but he's more efficient than ever uh completing a hair under 70 percent of his passes with a really deep and talented receiving core and i say all that to say i think penn state's going to do a good job against them just because i think penn state's defensive line the potential to stack a second good game in a row is right there for them and getting to do that and have this be just kind of a thing that you can use as a jumping off point heading into the end of the season and next season would be big. I think the secondary at this point betting against it seems like a fool's errand. But the interesting thing here is like you mentioned with their rushing game, Robin Hemby, 6.2 yards per carry, seven touchdowns. Antoine Littleton, the second, six yards per carry, six touchdowns. Talia's uh, added a couple on the ground. And it's going up, Daniel, against a Penn State linebacker core that it seems like, you know, it's James Franklin and injuries, so we never know exactly what's going to happen. It seems like Penn State might be going, Penn State's linebacker room is going into this game pretty wounded. Yeah, there, there's definitely a chance of that when, when you look at how last week ended with Tyler Elsden and Curtis Jacobs, both on the sideline. Um, Kobe King was really good uh, in relief of Tyler Elsden at that middle linebacker spot. Um, I think that's probably the best game of, of Kobe King's career. I mean, mm -hmm. small sample size for a redshirt freshman, but, you know, you kind of looked, you kind of saw, I think, what we were maybe expecting to see when he was competing with Elsden for that starting job. Um, but Elsden was back at practice tonight. Um, we didn't see Curtis Jacobs. Um, James Franklin was asked after the game about, um, you know, or after practice, you know, about whether he'll he'll have them this week. And he said that, you know, doesn't like to talk about injuries. So we'll find out Saturday. But I think that when you look at the linebacker core, um, you know, guys like, Ab like Abdul Carter is going to have to step up and have a really good game. Um, you know, like it or not, you're going to see a lot of Jonathan Sutherland um, and he's someone who is going to have to step up. Uh, and then when you even when you get behind the the three of Carter, King, uh, and Sutherland, suddenly you're down to you know Dom DeLuca, Charlie Catcher, Jamari Budden. Um, it gets kind of it gets late pretty early when you go down that depth chart. 
Last year, Penn State was just so fortunate that they made it through the season without any injuries to Brandon Smith, Jacobs, or Ellis Brooks, or Jesse Lucetta, um, because it was a similar situation last year. Uh, Keon Wiley, uh, the freshman from Philly, he was in his own uniform number for the first time tonight at practice. My colleague, Tyler Donahue, uh, he watches the defense uh, during practice. I watch the offense. Um, he noted that today, and Wiley is someone who has appeared in a handful of games, and he's someone who is going to redshirt, um, but he could be uh, a potential contributor. So that second level against a, a guy who is running the ball well, and he's a couple weeks removed from 24 for 179 and three touchdowns against Northwestern. Um, you know, you want that second level to be firmed up. Um, so I think that you're really going to be wondering about the health of that position. Um, and, you know, beyond just kind of the run game, Curtis Jacobs is just one of the, the best athletes that you have on your defense. You know, the five-star guy from Maryland. Um, and anytime you take that off the field, I mean, that's tough. That's like, you can't really replace that, you know, even if it's not Jonathan Sutherland backing him up, you, know, you still can't uh, re replace that and his ability to play in space. So it is going to be interesting to watch how Penn State is able to hold up. Um, you know, they did fine against Indiana, uh, but that was mostly because it felt like Indiana was more concerned with going horizontal uh, than, than vertical. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what it looks like, but I would not be surprised if Maryland comes out and really tries to take advantage of those linebackers, whether it's running the ball up the middle, you know, using crossing routes underneath, trying to get those tight ends in the space. Um, it's going to be very, it's going to be very worth watching how they attack those linebackers. I, 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 I'm going to push back on one thing. I think Indiana last week was not looking to do anything other than go home, uh, but neither, not, neither here nor there. Uh, last thing love, before love we look, someone like love something as much as Indiana likes to go three and out in less than a minute. That's man. That's all I'll say about that. I, I, I said it on the last pod, but if Tom Allen came out after the game and said the first backup that they put in, they were putting him in as punishment for like missing a class or something. I would have completely bought that. Like I'm, I am going to sit, like I'm going to continue to think about that game, not because of how good Penn State played, but just because like, yeah, it, it doesn't look good. Uh, I, the fact that I was worried about that game at all, I will continue to make fun of myself for that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's look at this game. Just any players on either side of the football for Penn State, for Maryland, whatever, who you're going to be keeping an extra close eye on uh, considering, you know, if Maryland wins, you think it's going to be because this player, this player, this player, if Penn State wins, this player, this player, that sort of thing. I'm going to, I think this is a pretty obvious pick, but I'm going to keep an eye on Drew Shelton. Um, mm -hmm. the, the freshman tackle made his first career start um, last week at Indiana. James Franklin didn't officially rule out Olu Fashionu for Saturday, um, but he gave him a week to week designation um, on Tuesday when we talked to him, which is, not one we usually hear. Like usually it's either we'll see how we get through the week or we'll hopeful. We're hopeful. You know, it's not, you know, week to week isn't something that, that we normally hear. So I kind of interpret that and, you know, reading the tea leaves um, as there's a, a decent chance that that fashion new isn't on the field, which means that it would be a true freshman and in, in big 10 action in Beaver stadium blocking Sean Clifford's blind side. Obviously, Indiana didn't do a whole lot uh, in terms of making things difficult uh, for the Penn State offensive line. After that one sack early where they got J.B. Nelson on a stunt, uh, the whole line, J.B. Nelson included, was just really solid the rest of the way. Um, but anytime you have a young guy um, blocking the blind side, I think that, that that is something that you're going to take note of. We touched on it. Maryland doesn't get a lot of sacks. Uh, Greg China Rose uh, leads them with, with four sacks right now. Um, so I think that, that Shelton is definitely someone on, on Penn State that, that you're watching because if he has a solid game, the Penn State offense is probably in, in good shape because that's kind of the one potential uh, weak point for them. Yeah, I'm fascinated in the chess match that's going to come between Jair Brown and Talia Tagovailoa because – I, I I mean, we saw it last year when Jair Brown 
in this game, in the Maryland game particularly, when he is able to get a beat on something, he makes something happen. Like he is, you know, I, I think Manny Diaz has mentioned like it's special getting to work with a player like him. And we've seen over the years and seen him in this exact game get to do that. And I think that Tao Lee is going to come up to the line and he is going to try to process everything as quick as possible before the snap and during the play. And I think a guy like Jair Brown, what he's going to do to organize Penn State's defense to try and read what Tally is going to do when he's looking over here, then looking over here, then coming back over here and then deciding something over here is what he actually likes. That's going to be big. And if you can take away Maryland's ability to throw the football, like I just don't know what the path is for them to win this football game. And then I want to see Chop Robinson going up against his old team, but that's just because like the sports writer in me is, uh, is revenge always, game. Yeah. Always fa- <laughs> revenge game, even though like, you know, by all accounts, it seems like he didn't leave under like bad circumstances or anything. It's just fun to call it a revenge game. Uh, it regardless, but, uh, this revenge game has Penn state has a 10 point favorite total is 59 FPI has them as a 70%, 78% chance of winning this game. Uh, SP plus has this game at Penn state's projected margin being 10.6 points projected score uh, of let's see, where is it? 33, 22. So the underwood hit Daniel, you hear all those numbers. What do you think? Do you think Penn state covers here? How do you think this game plays out? And if you want to give a score prediction, what would that look like? I've got I've got a couple other numbers that I think are, are pretty interesting when you look at the, the context of Maryland as a program uh, from sort of the big picture. Uh, these are going to be in my prediction on lions247.com at some point Thursday. Got to get my plug in. But since they joined the Big Ten uh, in in 2014, Maryland is 6-25 and in the month of November. Um, they've beaten Rutgers three times, Penn State twice in 2020 and 2014. Uh, and then Michigan in 2014. So you've got three wins over Rutgers, a win over COVID Penn State, a win over first year James Franklin, and a win over last year Brady Hoke. Um, And if you take that back to the start of 2011, uh, which was Randy Edsel's first year, uh, so this includes uh, three or four years in the ACC, uh, Maryland is 8-35 and in November. Um, So this is a, a team that, for whatever reason, struggles when it gets to this point um there are some extenuating circumstances and you know in those numbers like 2012 uh they had the linebacker quarterback for (laughs) the the last month of the season um and you know different things like that but i think that that's kind of where you see the difference between a penn state an ohio state even like a michigan state uh, in, in how these programs are built to withstand the rigors of a season uh to to build that depth to be able to to really play uh, at this time of year. And Maryland just kind of hasn't gotten there yet. Um, so I think that that's kind of a, it's an interesting trend. Um, I think that like when I was in college, uh, you know, my last three years of college were the first three years of the Randy Edsel era. And Randy Edsel didn't win a game uh, after October 13th until like his third season. And it was late November uh, in, in 2013. So it took him, you know, three seasons to be able to win a game in November, basically. Um, you know, it's a team where it's a program that just kind of has struggled to have that depth to be able to withstand some things. Um, so I know that's, that's a little bit more of a a big picture, uh, maybe a little bit more, you know, uh, less tangible, uh, way, way to look at, look at this matchup. But I do think that Penn state has the, has the talent advantage, um, I like the way that they're playing. I think the fact that they were able to go into Indiana and really take care of business and do what they needed to do against the bad team bodes well. Um, I think that it'll be a little bit similar to how last year's game went, where Maryland is hanging around early, you know, trying to make things interesting. But I think that you get one of those Tonga Vailoa mistakes, whether it's a, a pick six, a fumble, you know, a short field, something like that. I think that helps Penn State uh, gap Maryland. So I have Penn State 38, Maryland 24. Uh, Made that pick before I looked at the weather forecast, but I also did that last week when I picked uh, Penn State to route Indiana, and it ended up not mattering. So I'm going to roll with that again. 
Uh, I am now pulling up the daily forecast in State College for the next however many days. Yeah, Friday is supposed to have some uh, hurricane remnants, but Saturday is apparently supposed to be a, a very nice day. Uh, okay. I was, I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the time that Maryland – uh, had a linebacker at quarterback because I was going to ask, wasn't there a time that Maryland had a linebacker at quarterback? <laughs> and I was talking about the other time that happened. Uh, the uh, uh, the two guys, Sean Petty and Shane Cockerell. So, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> God. <laughs> I God, I would you should lean into that and just like that should be a thing that you lean into. We are the program where uh, you, if you play linebacker for us, there is a chance we will ask you to play on the other side of the football. But <laughs> it, in, in, in all seriousness, I do think that this game is going to come down to how long does it take Penn State to knock Talia Tagovailoa out of any sort of rhythm? Because, you know, I use the point guard analogy a little bit earlier. At the same time, he's like one of those microwave bench scorers that you see in basketball where you can bring him off of the bench and or you put him into a game in any situation. And if he sees a couple go in, next thing you know, he has 25 points. He is just there's just been an avalanche of stuff that he has been able to do because that's how talented he is and that's how good he is at his absolute best. So I think if Penn State's defense can prevent that for as long as they can or cut that off at the pass as soon as that starts to happen that is a huge 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 thing for them uh i think that penn state's offense has started to find a bit of a rhythm uh they're actually higher in offensive sp plus than maryland is which i i did not expect that coming to this game but they are 27th compared to 30th for maryland so i see that number 59 I don't know if they hit that just because, you know, the field could be a little bit sloppy, but a 10 point spread, something like Penn state 30, Maryland 20. I think that sounds right. Uh, But, you know, I'm not ruling out the possibility that, you know, that basketball ref uh, analogy, Talia sees a few go in and next thing, you know, Rakim Jarrett, Corey Dyche, Jacob Copeland, Jashawn Jones, like just all the Dante Demas is a big, uh, you know, the kind of big game that made him such a promising player last year. A snowball effect happens here. So I, I legitimately think this is going to be a, a good game. I think it's going to be a tough game for Penn state. I wouldn't be surprised if it ends and it's similar to last year's game where the final score is a little bit more flattering to Penn state than how it's played. But I ultimately do think Penn state wins and, you know, uh, they keep their hopes of a 10-win season alive. But uh, regardless, Daniel, as always, thank you for coming on. Incredibly generous of your time. Let the people know where they can find you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm over at uh, lions247.com. Um, you know, I work with Tyler Donahue, Mark Brennan, uh, to, and Tyler Calvaruso. We have, we have a great team over there. And uh, we have a lot of Penn State uh, men's basketball coverage. Uh, yes. That we've been yes. doing. So you can come to Lions 24-7 to, to get some of that. Uh, it's exciting start to the season. Um, you can follow me uh, on Twitter at Daniel JT Gallon. Um, after Bill mentioned Shane Cockerell, I did the old timeline search for all the times I, I tweeted about <laughs> uh, Shane Cockerell from when I was covering the team. And he also played fullback uh, for a little bit in addition to being a linebacker. Um, that was actually, he was like an elite 11 semifinalist uh, when they got him in the class of 2013. And uh you know, by the end, he's a, you know, a punt protector and, uh, you know, playing linebacker. It's quite, quite the trajectory. Um, and then you can also, you know, if you Google Daniel JT Gallon, you know, you can find me on, on Instagram, you know, on, you know, Facebook, uh, or Facebook is by Daniel JT Gallon. All the links are there. Uh, you know, if you want to remember some Maryland guys with me, hit me up and, and we can, uh, we can get going. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I was going to say DJ Moore, but DJ Moore is a little bit too good to be considered a guy. Uh, but regardless, Daniel, thank you very much for coming on to the pod. And thank you everyone for listening to this edition of the podcast. As always, make sure you're subscribing wherever you go and get your podcast. Head to our Twitter account. Click on the link tree link. It'll bring you to whatever you want. Uh, wherever you want to go to subscribe. If you use Apple Podcasts, if you use Spotify, go leave us a five-star review make sure you're following us on our twitter account at rlr blog and thank you again to homefield apparel for sponsoring the podcast again 
Roar Lions Roar, one word, all uppercase for 15% off of your first order. One last time, thank you everyone for listening to this edition of the pod. I'm Bill DeFilippo. Take care, everyone.